Hi guys, Ramon Goose here and welcome to The Guitar Show. In this video, we're gonna be looking at Alexander Howard Dumble's amplifiers. This is part one, we're gonna be looking at his upbringing, his early career. And uh, just from my personal experience, I've used a Dumble inspired amplifiers, as you know from this channel, for many, many years. In fact, Mystic Blues amp that I've got here is actually one of the, uh, I think it was the first amp to kind of replicate the Dumble 80s circuit back in 1994. Here's a photo of me with my amp and a real Dumble Overdrive Special, which I was very fortunate to play. So without further ado, let's roll the first video. This is all about the great man himself and his early upbringing, and I uh, hope you can enjoy it. Howard Alexander Dumble was born and grew up in Bakersfield, California, USA. He was born in 1945. His grandfather was a musician and his father was an engineer. When Alexander was only 12 years old, he started to build his own electronic equipment, such as transistor radios. His initial desire was to become a trombone player. But after he went to see a rock and roll concert, everything changed for him. And that was when he bought a guitar. When asked in an interview why he gravitated towards electronics, Dumble replied, I love music. For one thing, music's always been a passion. I used to listen to Les Paul and Mary Ford as a kid. Also, I come from an engineering family. I started making small pocket radios from scratch for kids in the school for $5 a pop. I was doing real well until one day everybody had one and there were enough radios in the class that you could hear the local rock station at a small din through all the earpieces. So the teacher finally busted me. Dumble was asked what inspired him to build his first amplifier. I was a junior in high school and this guy named Jack Smith came over and wanted me to build a piece of equipment for the Junior Baseball Association. We built this huge 200 watt power amplifier so they could announce to nine baseball diamonds. As I understand it, it still works today. Then Jack and I made some dual showman type amps. Although we couldn't get Fender transformers as they were very tight about what they'd send you, we used David Haffler transformers, which made the amps sound quite extraordinary. Dumble was asked to build your own amps had you taken apart other amps such as Fenders and Gibsons. And Dumble replied, I can draw some of those schematics from memory. Of course, I had to absorb other approaches. In fact, my old Fender mods I did in the late 1960s were exactly the same as the schematics a lot of the later high gain amplifiers used. When asked about his early music beginnings, Dumble replied, You know, I wanted to be a trombone player and we always had a piano in the house. There was always music around. My grandfather on my mother's side had a huge string band, unbelievably 20 pieces. I still have my first guitar and national guitar. I still have it. So after getting the guitar, that was it. I didn't like most of the amplifiers I could find at that time. This was back in the 1960s. He took up the guitar at age 16 and later did his fair share of studio dates in Hollywood, which included working with the songwriter, Jim Webb. After finishing high school. In 1965, he built a series of amplifiers for Mosrite, Semi Mosley of Mosrite Guitars commissioned Alexander to build 10 amplifiers for the Ventures. When asked how he came to make amps for the Ventures, Dumble replied, I was an 18 year old kid in school in Bakersfield. I went to see Semi Mosley, who was the only person I had access to there, and just bold faced said, I've got something that sounds like nothing else. You'd better hear it. And it flipped him out. He said, this is the best thing I've ever heard. He offered to go in with me to build 10 amplifiers. He bought the parts and paid me $90 a week for about four weeks. And then I had to work for free, but I still got to build 10 amplifiers on a production basis when I was only a kid. They were called must write amps, but they were my design. Actually, I built 11. So I still have the original one I built. The Ventures played through them and were really interested, but it was too much rock for them. They wanted me to go into business with them, but I decided against it and went back to playing in studios and in rock bands. Moss Wright only produced 11 Dumble designed amps. Apparently they were all piggyback heads. Ultimately, Moss Wright did not mass produce the Dumble designed amplifiers. And apparently Dumble fell out with Moss Wright over this. After this, he continued playing guitar and also work on his own future electronic designs. As a guitar player, he had the opportunity to work with various famous musicians in the studio and on tour. In the late 1960s, he was in a band called Captain Speed. And in 1967, 
His band actually did some warm-up gigs at a festival in Santa Barbara where he met Jimi Hendrix. During this time, Alexander never stopped studying various areas of electronics. And whilst he was modifying various amplifiers, he discovered that although most amplifier manufacturers tried to maintain a certain standard of quality for financial reasons, they also had to use many unmatched and cheaper parts. The sound and quality of their amplifiers would thus vary so drastically that it was nearly impossible to achieve any consistency within them. Dumble also worked as a music journalist and a radio presenter and in this capacity he was able to interview various musicians over the years and when he talked about equipment they all told him more or less the same story that mass production amplifiers simply lacked consistency. In the late 1960s Dumble opened a shop in Santa Cruz. By this time he had already built a couple of his own amplifiers like the Winterland and Dumbleland and during this period he was servicing and rebuilding many amplifiers for musicians. It was at this point in life he decided to become an amplifier builder. An extensive tool backing Buffy San Marie financed Dumble's first out of the backyard and into a building amp shop in 1968 in Santa Cruz. The following year Dumble came out with his explosion model amplifier. His original prototype still works which later evolved into the overdrive special amplifier. Jack Smith and Howard Dumble were best friends for over 40 years and for about five of those years, they shared a shop in Santa Cruz. When asked how he started building amplifiers with Dumble, Jack replied, we never stopped learning, and that's when the seeds were thrown out. Soon after we started building amplifiers, we got a letter from Fender's lawyers, a cease and desist order, as we were cloning amps. I've actually got one here. It's a bandmaster, but a hybrid we made. All these amplifiers were basically done to make money. Howard and me would listen to the customer and we had many different circuits, tone circuits and stuff, depending on what style the person played. Dumble felt that there were certain qualities lacking in commercially available amps of the period. Talking in a 1985 interview, Dumble states, One thing I noticed about early guitar amps was that they were real limited, especially in the lower end but you have to be careful to make sure you still keep the proper mid-range and treble response. You can't build a hi-fi circuit and expect it to be a good guitar amp. It just doesn't work out. You need a whole different response curve. But I did notice that if you put a little more low end into the preamp circuitry, it was much more tasteful and fun to play. Quoting Dumble from a 1987 interview, he says, When you're building stuff on a custom level, you can get real picky, and that's the way I do it. I have to reject 30% of parts that I buy. Dumble said in 1987, You have to know what sounds good and what sounds bad. And that seems to be the separating line. I would almost tend to say that the criteria is almost more important. You have to have the ear. The first official Howard Dumble amplifier was called Explosion. Dumble says, right after I separated away from the Ventures, they were pretty crude looking. In fact, I've got one here. I keep it hidden here. I made way, way back in the 60s. I didn't call it Overdrive. In fact, on the switch, it just said Explosion 1 and 2. And then I started thinking, how hip would it be if I could pad in this foot switch and do all this stuff? When Dumble was asked what modifications his Explosion amplifier underwent before it became the Overdrive Special, Dumble replied, the active circuitry changed quite a bit and the tone circuitry did also, but the concept of processing the signal post preamp stayed the same. Most other high gain amplifiers use a pre preamp gain boost, but I broke away from that quite early in the late 1960s. I found that trying to build the signal up before the preamp had a tendency to really overload the preamp and you got non-harmonic tones and a very unmusical end result. Plus, you ran into a lot of vacuum tube problems with harmonics. So what I wanted to do was get all the wonderful oomph and beautiful sustain and harmonic richness without the electronic troubles. By 1968 and 69, Dumble was making some really heavy duty amplifiers that were rated at 200 watts. Dumble says, Way back then I was building high power vacuum tube amplifiers. I still have some of them and they still work in fact. I've currently got one on tour with Steve Ray Vaughan right now. One that I built way back in 1968. Probably the first real Dumble amplifier 
was the Winterland, which was about 220 watts. It was also available as a straightforward power amp with up to 450 watts. These could be used with any type of preamp. The Dumble Winterland Amplifier was one of the first professional music products released by Howard Alexander Dumble under his own name. The Winterland was designed as a bass amplifier with 220 watts, but many guitarists used it as well. Okay guys, this is the Winterland. And this amplifier was one of the first musical products released by Dumble. The Winterland was basically designed as a bass amplifier with 220 watts of power. But a lot of guitarists used this amp as well. Along with this, he built a Winterland as a straightforward power amplifier with up to 450 watts or more. It was equipped with three octal preamp tubes and four KT88 power amp tubes. But as KT88 power tubes were sometimes hard to find, in some models he replaced these with 6550 tubes. Dumble named this amplifier after a famous concert hall in San Francisco. It's also important to mention that this is actually a dyno kit amplifier that Dumble built. One source of inspiration for this amp might have been a Marshall Major 200 watt power amplifier, which is also equipped with KT88 power tubes. Dumble's friend Jack Smith says the following about the Winterland amplifier. As far as I can remember, Howard built them from Michael Hosa, a bass player. Michael was using a Sun bass amp before and Howard made him two Winterlands and they sounded great. Actually, I had one of them here in the shop not too long ago and it still works perfectly. The Winterlands basic tone has many of the Dumble-like characteristics. However, the clean tone differs from the Overdrive Special's clean tone. The Dumble Winterland was a beautiful sounding bass and guitar amplifier that produced more natural clean sounds with a far greater harmonic response than many amplifiers of its time. The Winterland was only available as a silver face model, with perhaps no more than 20 examples ever being made. As you can see in this photo of the front panel, it has the following features. Two inputs, volume, treble and bass controls with treble and bass boost switches. Thanks guys for watching this video. In part two, we're gonna be looking at all the various Dumble models such as the Overdrive Special and the Steel String Singer. Until then, God bless, Goose signing out.